Hi, my name is Jason Lauritsen. Uh, going to do a YouTube video again this week for this week's assignment, which is about special education. Um, in the first part of this, when we were asked to activate prior knowledge with the idea of what comes to mind when you hear special education, um, I probably have a little bit different view or like a different feeling of what comes in mind than a lot of my classmates just because of my age. Um, I started elementary school in 1980. Back then, special education was, I mean, it, special education under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, 1975, special education was available, but it was much different than what we see now, typically. Um, there were special education classes for kids with learning disabilities, um, but they were kept completely separate from the, the general education students. Um, honestly, the only time we came in contact with any of the special education students was at recess. You would, you would see them or come in contact with them very little and just, like I said, out on the playground, which that, you know, not having contact with students with disabilities led to a lot of the, you know, societal issues that we'd have with not understanding and accepting other people's differences and it just, it's a much different environment now and a much better environment. Um, but that's just how I wanted to start this, just talking about the fact that it, there's definitely a difference in how special education is treated from when I went through school and, and now. Um, so as we walk down through the assignment this week, um, the first part dealing with um, IEPs. Um, let's just go over that. I mean, IEPs are are covered under the IDEA and the IDEA Part B that was signed into law in 2004. Um, IEP stands for Individual Education Plan. Um, it's a way to have a structured education plan for students with disabilities that impact their ability to receive an education. Um, I have had some personal uh, knowledge of the IEP process, um, and I've talked about it in previous videos. My son has ADHD and uh, high-functioning autism, and he, he went through an IEP evaluation, uh, not really by his mom and my choice. Um, he's my stepson. His, his father requested it. Um, my wife's a teacher of 20 years. She knew that our son wouldn't qualify for an IEP, but we went through the process anyways. Um, the reason he doesn't qualify for an IEP is that his disabilities don't impact his ability to receive an education enough to basically to qualify. Um, so we knew that going in. He's in middle school right now and that kind of leads us to the, the next part. Even though he didn't qualify for an IEP, we did hope that he would qualify for a 504 plan. So a 504 plan is is covered under not under the IDEA but under the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. Um, and the 504 plan, it's it's nicknamed the 504 plan as we saw in some of the videos because of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, I think it was. Um, and basically what that allows is not a structured 
individual education plan per se, but allows accommodations for students with disabilities that do impact their ability to receive an equal or equitable education. Um, but it's not a structured plan. It's more like accommodations. And accommodations that, similar to what we'd see in UDL principles, um, which is one of the reasons why UDL is such a great idea that, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So 504 plan, what we were hoping for is, my son is very intelligent. He, he has no problem with the coursework, but because of his ADHD and his issues with um, his autism diagnosis, he has a hard time focusing, following through. He needs a lot of help, a lot of instruction, a lot of reminding. Um, as an elementary student, it impacted him less because he was with the same teacher all day long. Um, and he would get a lot of reminders and a lot of help. And once kids move into middle school, that's not always the case. So we were hoping that he would qualify for a 504 plan so that he could get some accommodations. Um, special seating is an example. It's not really as big an issue with him, um, but you know, some of the UDL principles, uh, more selective seating or allowed to get up and move around a bit stuff like that. Um, the big things we were hoping that he would qualify for, uh, some students get like more time for tests. Um, not really an issue with him once again, but what we really were hoping for is that a, a fairly common accommodation in a 504 plan is the ability to turn in late work um, without a penalty, like late homework. That is one of the biggest issues we've had with him is getting his work turned in on time and it impacted his grades a lot because you know he's getting zeros on a bunch of his work and we would really try to help him with that I mean I'd make sure his homework was all stacked up and I'd put sticky notes on it like turn this in in science class and it would come home with him because he'd forget or just couldn't be bothered to do it you know it wasn't important to him and it he wasn't able to focus on it um the sad thing is we did reach out to his teacher even though he doesn't qualify for a 504 plan um we were hoping that you know we didn't want extra accommodations per se but just some um, you know if we could just get a list of like his assignments for the week, you know, um, which is something we should remember when we do become educators. Uh, using UDL principles, we can help a lot with kids that may slip through the cracks and not qualify for some of these plans, but maybe just need a little extra help or some small accommodations that if we're allowing for all students in our class will allow the students that really need it to access it because um, like we were turned down for something as simple as just asking the teacher for you know a list of assignments a week and we were told you know that wouldn't be fair because she doesn't do that for every kid well that's less of a problem with us asking for it as the fact that that's not something that the teacher is providing you know that's what's the reason there I mean that would help students if there was easier access to make sure that they could get all of their work and nothing slipped through the cracks but kind of went off on a tangent there that's basically IEP and 504 um, that brings us to RTI um, response to intervention. Uh, this was something I didn't have a lot of information regarding before going through this week's assignment. Um, it was interesting just the fact that it's, you know, the screening uh, in the general ed classes 
uh, for early intervention, making sure that we are catching some of these issues early. Um, one of the things with that, and I've spoke about that before, is the fact that a lot of the early intervention is really focused on reading and making sure that we're catching kids with reading problems. My math's my thing. I kind of focused on that a lot. And we're lacking early intervention right now for some of the students that have trouble with math and catching it early. Um, you know, everybody hears about dyslexia, and that's a real focus for catching, you know, early on students that have that issue so that, you know, we can get some intervention in there to help them with, with that. Um, but there's something like dyslexia, except with numbers. It's called dyscalculia, and it's kind of, you know, some people call it number math, uh, dyslexia. Not as common, I don't believe, as dyslexia, but it is out there. And even though it's not as common, it, I think it's missed very often because it's just not well known. Um, in that same section, uh, it was interesting about the Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 um, pyramid uh, The with the interventions. Just the high quality, um, scientifically based classroom instruction uh, combined with ongoing assessments, um, tiered instruction, differentiation, we went over that before. And it, the way the pyramid was set up, it was kind of interesting that, you know, 80 to 85 percent of the students are going to be in that tier one. Um, you know, well, all students are in that tier one. It's just 80 to 85 percent of them that will handle the amount of, you know, they'll stay in there with their general education as opposed to, you know, a few students will need to go into tier two and very few will go into tier three. And general ed instruction is tier one, tier two. Tier three is where you're going to have your specialists and your special special ed instruction. Um, bringing us to kind of the third topic this week. And this was one where I really, I had not ever thought about this, um, that there was an actual, you know, area called 2E, twice exceptional. And it makes a lot of sense, because I've talked about that, the fact that my, my son is in gifted and talented, but he also has disabilities that do impact the way that he learns. Um, and the video about that was very interesting. Uh, the gentleman talking about the 2E, the twice exceptional, is that those are some of his favorite students and some that he thinks will have the biggest, you know, impact on, you know, future developments. I mean, we've seen that with like uh, the old, it was Asperger's syndrome versus just, you know, high functioning autism. Um, that really hit home with that section because it was talking about, you know, you, you go both ways. You have students with special needs and that can oftentimes mask some of their giftedness. Or you have a student in the gifted program that because he's gifted, a lot of the special need issues, the the underlying disabilities get glossed over, and it comes across more as the student being, you know, lazy or unmotivated instead of having genuine disabilities that are impacting the way that he, he or she is able to, you know, access education. A um, few things that I picked up from that that were really interesting to me is that the 2E students, they're, you know, three to five percent I think is what they said which that doesn't seem very high but that's you know one in 20 students out there so we're talking you know 
one in 20, we're getting two and a half per pair of classrooms. You know, there's, um, they're out there. We're, they're, they're in the student body and it's, it's an issue that we need to be aware of. Uh, one thing that really, I guess I was really surprised at is that, you know, we've learned that there's not mandated, you know, structured laws regarding the fact that, you know, schools have to supply gifted programs. But the fact that in the reading, learning that some, some schools actually forbid students to access to the gifted program if they're receiving services like a IEP or a 504 plan, um, or if they allow them to go into the gifted program or any of the gifted classes, that they'll actually lose their services. And that's just, it's just you're, you're either keeping those students from having access to the gifted program or you're punishing them and impacting the rest of their education by the fact that they are involved with the gifted program. Um, I went really long this week and I didn't think I was going to, but uh, thank you for listening and have a great night.